Let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to Colossians chapter 3. It's exciting to be back in the pulpit this morning. I uh, was able to take a week off last week and uh, go camping with my family and very much appreciate the opportunity to do that. Uh, last week was a very exciting time for me uh, because you may, you may have seen on social media that the first Sunday of August each year is my anniversary week of being the pastor of New Providence Baptist Church. And, and this August represents nine years, and I'm very thankful for that. Uh, but I'm, I'm excited to be back in Colossians. When I miss a week, it's kind of like missing a meal. You, you get, uh, you're, you're more hungry than normal. You're starving and can't wait to get to the table again. And that's how I feel about being able to preach this morning. And so we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 9 of Colossians chapter 3. Uh, I want to do a little bit of an introduction today. You may see the, uh, the title and, and it strike a little bit of fear or anxiety in your mind of attack sin. Man, that's abrasive language. But I hope that you will see after the sermon today that dealing with sin in the life of a believer is not a light matter. It's something that we have to attack. Uh, if you don't attack sin, I guarantee you it will attack you. And oftentimes as you're putting forth energy in trying to attack it, it is still trying to attack you. Uh, sin is like a, an overthrown monarch. I, I read this illustration this week and it just really resounded with, resonated with me. An overthrown monarch who doesn't know he's been overthrown. And so he's running around trying to gather all of his uh, previous projects or, or previous citizens and pull them back under his reign even though he has no right to do so. Doesn't that sound exactly like what sin does to us? Even though we've been set free, even though we have a, a new king, even though we have a new citizenship, it's running around and Satan's running around trying to drag us back into bondage even though he has no right to do so. And just to show you from scripture that this is something we all battle with, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's something we all struggle with. And another illustration that I have heard that goes so well with our battle against sin is sin is like cancer. And if you know anything about cancer, cancer is never satisfied with how much of your body it consumes. And that's why it has to be attacked at all costs. Sin is the exact same way. If you leave it in your body, it is never satisfied with how much of you it consumes and it will continue to eat away and to consume more and more until it is dealt with. That's why it must be dealt with and eradicated at all costs. Sin has absolutely no place in the life of a believer. Uh, I've also heard it said that uh, when you wake up as a Christian, when you wake up every morning, there are two dogs fighting to consume you that day. The dog of the flesh and the dog of the spirit. And which one is victorious at the end of the day? The one you feed. The one you show the most attention to. Uh, the one you enable. And, and so uh, if we feed the flesh, it's going to rise up and it's going to defeat us that day. But if we feed on the things of the Spirit, we will be able to subdue the attacks of the flesh. It's so important for us to recognize that this is a battle, that we have to fight against it, that we have to be victorious on a daily basis. Uh, and I just want to, uh, based off of some meetings that I've had over the last two weeks with individuals uh, and, and conversations that I've been able to have with believers and unbelievers alike, I just want to stop for a moment and ask a rhetorical question that I'd like for you to answer within your own heart this morning. Have you ever had the struggle or the doubt that you are really saved? And, and I'm talking to Christians this morning. Uh, have you ever had a moment in your life where you've said, man, am, am I really saved? Have I really had a conversion experience? Is, is what I'm placing my hope in, is that what's going to get me to heaven? Do I really have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Let me tell you what causes that doubt to arise in Christians more than anything else. The presence of sin. Think about it. 
When, when we struggle with something or when we fall or when we give in to a temptation, we are left in the aftermath thinking, am I even a believer? I, why did I do such a thing that is so disgraceful to the God that I so-called am a, a servant of or a child of? Why did I do this? Am I even saved? And that's another reason why this sin has to be attacked at all costs is because it messes with the foundation of our faith. We've got to get rid of it. We've got to get it out of the way because it is such a spiritual distraction to the foundation that Christ lays for us in salvation. Now, I do want to say uh, one thing. Uh, today's sermon on attacking sin. This is going to be directed at believers in Jesus Christ. The reason I need to make that statement, that today a sermon on attacking sin is directed at discipling believers, is because if you're an unbeliever in here today and you're receiving today's message, you could very easily stumble into the thought that you've got to reach perfection before you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is not the case. Christ comes to where you are. You cannot go to where he is. So don't, don't think that this is a standard to achieve salvation. What we're talking about today is a battle after you are saved to attack sin at all costs, to live this holy life surrendered unto Jesus Christ uh, and to mirror him and to, to be a witness and a testimony of him each and every day. And the only way that can happen is if you are if you are attacking and fighting against sin head on. So please take it in that way and know that surrendering your life to Jesus Christ involves repentance. It revolves turning from your wicked ways and turning toward Christ. And in order to do that, we've got to attack the sin that so easily trips us up or ensnares us, as the writer of Hebrews puts it. Uh, so this is a fight, and... and you might say, based off of the last sermon that I preached in Colossians 3, we talked about in verses 1 through 4, that since your citizenship is now in heaven, your actions should reflect the things of heaven, not the things of this world. Your speech, your thoughts, your, uh, your, do, your deeds each and every day, your testimony should reflect where your citizenship is. And it says in verses 1 through 4 that you have been crucified with Christ, and you have been resurrected with Christ to walk in newness of life. So set your things, your mind on the things above, not on the things of this world. And so it sounds like we might be backtracking or contradicting ourselves to say that we have to attack sin and die to sin each and every day. But let me, let me put this together for you. Positionally, you have already been crucified to sin. All right, we're talking about the penalty. But in reality, each and every day, the power of sin will rise up and will jump on you every time you let your guard down. So we're not talking about where we are in Christ for eternity. Yes, the power, the penalty of sin has already been satisfied in Christ Jesus. But the, the daily struggle is real, folks. Does anybody disagree with that? The daily struggle is real. The struggle against sin. Paul explains it in Romans 7 that it's like everything I want to do, I find myself doing the opposite. And everything I don't want to do, that seems to be what I wind up doing. Who will rescue me from this wretched man that I am? And he's describing that daily battle. And I would say that that battle really doesn't begin until you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Because prior to that, sin is a way of life. But that can no longer be the case for a Christian. We have to attack it. And so let's look at this battle cry in Colossians 3, verses 5 through 9, uh, where Paul charges believers to put to death the sin that's in their life. Kill it. Attack it. And let's stand as we read these verses together. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. 
Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds. Father, as we are charged by the Apostle Paul today and by your Holy Spirit that lives within us to fight sin and to put off sin and to to kill sin on a daily basis, charge us with the drive and the fortitude and the desire to strive for perfection and to represent your son Jesus Christ here on this earth, not to be satisfied with worldly things characterizing us as your children. Lord, we need your help in this fight. May we draw strength from the teaching of your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now mentioned earlier that positionally you have already been rescued from the penalty of sin. But this walk that we have, this new walk, this new life has a battle attached to it. Romans 6, 6 says, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So we've died to the penalty, but we must fight against the power. Uh, Sanctification is the process of fighting the temptation of sin and becoming more like Christ every day that you live out your faith here on this earth. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, down toward the end of that chapter, Paul declares, I have to die daily in this battle. I have to die daily to self, to be raised to walk in newness of life, to to surrender to the call that Christ has put on my life. I have to die daily to the temptations of this world so that I might not be disqualified from the calling that he has placed on my life. And Paul begins this passage with the charge, Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. This is a reference to the old sinful flesh that that came to be here in the earthly sphere. The word therefore is always a transition word that causes us to look back to the verses that came right before it. And so we look back to verses 1 through 4 where Paul declares for us both to be crucified and resurrected with Christ and we should therefore no longer live as this world lives. Since our citizenship is not of this world, neither should our behavior be of this world. People should be able to look at the way we act and the way we talk and tell that person is from somewhere else. Their citizenship is in heaven. The the verb put to death literally means to kill or to consider as dead. This brings about the idea of waging war against sin. It is a very intense verb. We are to put to death. We are to kill. We are to consider as dead and keep it dead as we wage war against sin and its temptations. Christians cannot be content to just allow any particular sin to remain unfault in their lives. We, we tend to categorize sin. Uh, I hear a lot of believers say all sin is equal. And when they say that, they're referring to the penalty of sin. All sin is worthy of eternity in hell because it, uh, it separates you from an almighty God. So in that case, yes, all sin is equal. But then what they do in their lives is they put them into different categories. They put them in categories of heinous sin, sins that they would not even dare think of committing. And then they have this other category that you might call acceptable sin. Sins that, well, it just happens. Nobody's perfect. You ever heard that comment? Nobody's perfect. This just happens. Uh, I, I was in a hurry, so I drove 56 instead of 55. Guess what? That's a sin. Okay, but we don't think nearly as much about those sins as we do about the sins of murder or the sins of adultery or the sins of, of lying or the sins of stealing. Sins that, and, and here's where Christians really falter. They tend to measure sins by the consequences they have here in this life. Think about that. They tend to measure sins by the immediate consequences. Well, that sin will send you to jail, but this one will probably benefit you in business practice. Okay? We we have got to attack all sin, and Christians cannot afford to be okay with any sin whatsoever remaining unfault or unresisted 
in their lives. You've got to attack all of it. Christ died for all of it, and you've been raised to walk contrary to that sin. Therefore, put to death your members which are on this earth. Satan doesn't need a foothold into your life. And every little sin that you leave over in the margin is a foothold for him to get in. And he's going to seize every opportunity you give him. Paul gives us in this passage two lists. The first list are personal sins. The second list are social sins. All right, so the first one are sins you do within yourself. The second list are sins you do toward others. And then he separates these two lists with two very good reasons of why you need to attack them, of why you need to kill them, of why you need to put them to death. Uh, So let's look at list number one, the personal sins, verse five. This list has in it fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. All right, I'm going to briefly define these. Fornication is a reference to all sexual sin outside of marriage. The Bible is very clear on how it forbids sexual activity outside of the covenant of marriage between one man and one woman. And I want to add something else to that because I watch it become so acceptable among Christian circles. This is regardless of what age category you fall into. Why is it okay, or or why is it so abhorred and resisted for teenagers to be sexually active outside of marriage, but we don't say anything about adults who do it? Is it okay for adults? Do you you reach a certain age where it's okay or, or acceptable? Absolutely not. We have to attack these sins, no matter what category we are in, and put them to death. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Then the next uh, item in the list is uncleanness. This is more of a general term. This goes beyond the actual act and talks about the evil thoughts and the intentions of the heart that lead to the act. All right, uh, Mark 7, verses 20 through 23. And he said... What comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. So evil behavior is the result of evil thinking. That's why an attack against evil behavior needs to begin in the mind and in the heart. It needs to begin internally before you'll ever see a result in the actions. That's why Paul says, fill your mind with things that honor God and your life will follow. Uh, Philippians 4.8, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure... Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue or if there's anything praiseworthy, fill your mind with these things. Meditate on these things so that it will affect the actions that are coming out from those thoughts and the condition of the heart. And then keeping with the same category of of sexual actions, sexual temptations, Paul adds passion and evil desire Uh, to make sure that we recognize that the battle against sexual sin starts in the mind and in the heart before we'll ever see victory in the flesh. And then at the end of this list, Paul puts covetousness. Now I wonder if that's coincidental. Because if it's coincidental, then it's also a coincidence that it finds itself at the end of the Ten Commandments as well. Why do you think covetousness is tacked on the end of this list? I want to share with you today, and, and, and hopefully you'll see, and we'll unite on this, is that covetousness really is the root of these other sins. Covet, covetousness, as he says here in verse 5, essentially is idolatry, because what is covetousness? Covetousness is following your own personal desire, even when it contradicts with God's desire. That's idolatry. Right, So covetousness, pride, selfishness, this is the desire that is the root 
to all other sin is I want what I want and I don't care about anything else. I don't care about anybody else. I don't care about the reflection it's going to have on God. I don't care about what he says about it. I'm going to follow what my desire is. It's a selfish desire and I covet it. All right, that's why this made it at the end of the list, both in the Ten Commandments and here in this passage, is that if we can attack covetousness, we can find victory over those other sins as well. So let's, let's remedy this for a moment. How do you attack covetousness? What's the opposite of covetousness? Contentment. Where does contentment come from? Trusting in God. So how do you attack the root of sin? You trust in God instead of in yourself, and you find contentment in Him instead of earthly things. That's the whole theme of this chapter is set your mind on the things above, on the things of the Scripture, not on the selfish, uh, tempting things of this world. And so we attack this sin by becoming satisfied in what God provides, not in what our own selfish desires seek. Philippians 4.11, Paul testified, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Attacking covetousness attacks the root of personal sin. Then Paul gives us two reasons of why we should attack sin. So focus your attention on verses 6 and 7. Reason number one of why you should attack sin at all costs. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. All right, you ready for a deep theological explanation of this verse? A good reason to put sin to death is because sin makes God mad. Is that a good reason? Sin makes God mad. God absolutely hates sin. That's a really good reason for his followers to put it to death. All right, simply put, God brings his wrath upon the sin and the sons of disobedience. Uh, A.W. Pink defined God's wrath this way. His eternal detestation of all unrighteousness. It is the displeasure and indignation of divine equity against evil. It is the holiness of God stirred into activity against sin. Now, unbelievers who have not surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ who paid the price of this wrath. Jesus Christ drank the whole cup of God's wrath in six hours as he hung on the cross of Calvary. So those who surrender their lives to Jesus Christ, they will not experience that wrath. But unbelievers, the other category, will experience God's wrath in its eternity, in its entirety, by spending an eternity in hell. Because they did not surrender their lives to Jesus Christ. There's, there's only two ways to get that price paid for. Either Christ paid it or you're going to pay it yourself. Okay, so this is not, Paul is not saying here that if a believer in Christ commits sins that are in this list, then they will experience God's wrath. That can't be what he's saying. That would be a contradiction of those who live in Christ, those who have been saved by Christ, will not experience God's wrath. Remember Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. But what Paul is saying here is why would a child of God want to live like a child of wrath? Why in the world would a child of God who has been redeemed from sin want to be characterized by sin? It makes absolutely no sense. Which brings us to reason number two. Those who are in Christ who love him and desire that he be glorified should not participate in the deeds of those who are going to experience God's wrath. Reason number two. In which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Paul says the reason you should put sin to death is that's not who you are anymore. That shouldn't describe you anymore. You've been raised to walk in a new life, and that old life should have nothing to do with you. It should not characterize you in any way. You remember what it was like to live in bondage to sin and to be lost without hope. You remember how it only delivered to you temporary happiness and, and, and soon after brought you to destruction. You remember what, it, what uh, awful, hopeless life it was 
to live in sin. Why would you want to go back to those days? You yourselves once walked when you lived in them. I like how Charles Haddon Spurgeon put it. Uh, it says, this is a, a little bit of a lengthy quote, but please listen to, to the impact of this truth. Christian, what hast thou to do with sin? Hath it not cost thee enough already? Burnt child, wilt thou play with fire? What, when thou hast already been between the jaws of the lion, wilt thou step a second time into his den? Hast thou not had enough of the old serpent? Did he not poison all thy veins once? Oh, be not so mad, so foolish. Did sin ever yield thee real pleasure? Didst thou find solid satisfaction in it? If so, then go back to thine old drudgery and wear the chain again if it delight thee. But inasmuch as sin did never give thee what is promised to bestow, but deluded thee with lies, be not a second time snared by the old fowler. Be free, and let the remembrance of any ancient bondage forbid thee to enter the net again. You look back at who you used to be before Christ. Let that be a reason of why you never want to dabble in that stuff again and put it to death. Get rid of it. Eradicate it from your life. Why would anyone who has been made rich return to the slums to live in poverty? And why would anyone who has been set free return to a life of bondage? Romans 6, 1 and 2 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? So after presenting what I think is two pretty good reasons of why we as Christians should put sin to death. Number one, it makes God really mad. And number two, I remember who I used to be and I don't want to be that person anymore. So I should attack it and put it to death. Then Paul gives a second list of sins. Now, let me remind you, these two lists are by no way exhaustive. There are sins that you are creative enough to come up with that are not in this list. Would you agree? Okay, so we need to put those to death as well. But this list is a list of social sins. Let's attack them as well. Uh, verses 8 and 9. But now you yourselves are to put off all these. And here's the list. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. These are sins that are a little less personal because they don't just affect you or are committed within you. These are sins that you commit directly against other people. Uh, and we should put these things off. The, the verb put off all these brings about the idea of taking off an old garment and discarding it. Okay, so uh, 1 Corinthians says it as, or, or 2 Corinthians, put off the old self because all things have become new. So it's like taking off an old dirty garment, putting on a new one, and continuing to do these sins would be going back and pulling that old soiled garment out of the trash and putting it back on and wearing it again in its uncleanness. And so we're, we're to put it off and to leave it off. Uh, and, and that's exactly what we need to do with this list. So what does this list have in it? If you look at the, uh, the root meaning of each word that Paul used, the first is anger. This is not a superficial emotion. This is a, a heart attitude. All right, this is a deep, resentful bitterness. And so whenever you see this sin committed, it wasn't the situation that caused it. It was the situation that gave it a target to aim at. Angry people that just look for opportunities to spew that anger, that has no place in the life of a believer. The next one is wrath. This does refer to the superficial act or an, an outburst of anger. Malice is a general term for moral evil. This is a bent or a feeling of causing harm to other people. This has no place in the life of a believer. And then the word blasphemy. Now, now this is, this is kind of neat. Uh, the word blasphemy in some of your translations is translated slander. Because we're talking about sins committed against other people. Why is it translated blasphemy? Well, if you think about it, when you slander other individuals, you are essentially blaspheming God who created those individuals, right? 
He created them in His image. Male and female are created in the image of God. We are to show dignity to the human race because of their creation, because of who they were created by. And so it's blasphemy uh, to slander other individuals. And then, lastly, filthy language. The, the New Testament is very clear about this. Ephesians 4.29, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but, that, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearer. You ever heard the, the age-old encouragement? If you uh, don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all. If what you're going to say does not build up or constructively uh, help the person you're saying it about, it shouldn't be said. That's a biblical concept. Ephesians 5, 4, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, saints neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. So replace it with giving of thanks, giving thanks to God, giving thanks for others, being edifying. Jesus was very clear about how serious your words are. Matthew 12, 36. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account for it in the day of judgment. So it is, it is important for us to to guard our tongues, which James said is the most difficult part of the body to subdue. And then Paul ends this list with one that really doesn't need an exp explanation. Do not lie to one another. Be truthful. And, and so what I want to do, after looking at both of these lists and two really good reasons of putting it to death, hopefully if you, if you weren't convinced already that sin was a bad thing in the life of a believer, hopefully you've been convinced from the scripture today, hey, I need to put a little bit more effort in my Christian walk toward attacking sin. I cannot allow any of it to remain dormant in the margins of my life. I cannot allow any of it to go unattacked or, or unfault, un, or, or I have to resist all of it. I can't have these categories of sin that I'm okay with keeping in the back corner. Satan will use those to rise up against me. I want to close by giving you two practical steps this morning of how you can carry out the warning from today's message from the Apostle Paul to attack sin at all costs. There's two ways you can do that. And you got to do this on a daily basis. All right, so if, if you don't have a copy of today's notes, make sure you write these two steps down. Very important in acting out today's sermon. Step number one of how you attack sin is you starve it. Okay? Think back to the two dogs illustration. You starve it. How do you do that? You know what the temptations are. Don't go where they are. Come on, guys. You, uh, I, Pastor, I fell again. Well, where were you when you fell? At the bar. Don't go where they are. Starve it, okay? I, I get so tired of people stumbling and falling because they put themselves right in the lion's den again, and then they were surprised it bit them, Okay? So, so you starve it. You don't give it a time of day. Don't go where it is. Don't, don't do the things that normally lead to, to it happening. Starve it to death. And you'll be so much stronger to resist it. And then number two, starve it, but, but secondly, crowd it out. All right, you know if you, if you eliminate a bad decision out of your life and you don't replace it with anything, another bad one will jump in on top of it. Crowd it out. Well, what do you crowd it out with? You crowd it out with the things of God's Word. You crowd it out with the truths of Scripture. You crowd it out with time spent worshiping Him. You crowd it out by being here. You crowd it out by getting in discipleship groups. You crowd it out by reading the Scriptures. You crowd it out by praying. Don't give it any room to grab hold of you. Starve it and crowd it out. That will make your fight successful. Remember, you are already victorious. Amen? The battle has already been won. You just got to fight the, uh, the, the residual effects of being in this world until Christ comes back to get you. All right? And the way you do that on a daily basis is resist it, starve it, and crowd it out with the things of God. Get around people who are fighting the same fight. Don't get around those people who call themselves Christians, but they keep meddling in the same muck. Every single day. You don't need to be around them except to, hey, you need to come to church with me. We, we need to get you out of that crowd. They'll drag you down, okay? Be a witness to them, but that's not who you need to be 
crowding your time with. You need to crowd it out. You need to surrender to the things of God in order to glorify Him each and every day. And let me tell you, it's a fight. you got to view it as a fight. I was talking to a guy one time who professed to be a believer. And it was this particular sin that he was battling with. And I said, I want to share something with you. you. You said it was a battle. It can never stop being a battle. This sin that you're struggling with can never define you because you, you can't be defined as a, and then fill in the, the sin, and be defined as a Christian. That, that habitual lifestyle is not characteristic of a person who has surrendered their life to Christ. So it has to remain a battle. Never stop fighting. And we prayed, and, and I've continued to hold this guy accountable. Don't put down the gloves. Fight it every single day. Has the fight gotten any easier? It's been two years. No, it hasn't. But he fights it every single day. We've got to learn from that. We've got to attack sin at all costs. It's never okay to wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I'm tired. I don't feel like fighting Satan today. That's a day that he's going to be victorious. We can't afford those days in the Christian walk. He will win every opportunity we give him because he's good at what he does. But remember, James 4, he's like a bully that can't handle being bullied. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So we have to surrender to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Let that be an encouragement to you today. Sin is already defeated in Christ Jesus, but you have to attack it every day to keep it dead. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the encouragements that we receive from your word every time we open it up. And today, the encouragement we receive from the Apostle Paul's writings in Colossians is to attack sin with all that we are, with all that we have, with every waking moment, so that it will not rise up against us and damage our witness and testimony of you. Father, every believer in this room needs a probing from your Holy Spirit this morning to understand the consequences of leaving sin dormant in their lives. Or even flirting with it and getting around it and, and messing with the temptation. We have no business doing that. We are not strong enough in ourselves to get close to it without getting burned. Help us to attack it from uh, the ground up. Help us to attack it head on. To attack it in our hearts. To attack it with our words. To attack it with our actions. To starve it and to crowd it out with the things of you the things of your word, to memorize scripture as the children do in Awana so that uh, thy word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. That, that is crowding it out in our hearts, Lord. Encourage us to, to set that model for our children that sin is not acceptable. Sin invokes the wrath of God. Sin is who I used to be and it's not who I am anymore. So help us to fight. Help us to strive for perfection until the day that Jesus Christ returns and to fight against sin with all that you have given us. And Father, I pray, Lord, if, there, if there's anyone here today that is still caught in the grip and bondage of sin and they are experiencing your wrath upon sin and will spend an eternity in hell, Lord, I pray if it be your will today that you would rescue them that you would redeem them through the work that your son Jesus Christ did on the cross. And that they could join this battle with us because it is so rewarding. The battle is fierce, but the reward is so much greater. Lord, we thank you for eternal life in heaven that comes only through Jesus Christ. So we ask all of this in his precious and holy name. Amen.